everyone. My name is Patty Valdovinos, and I'm a librarian in the Multilingual Collections Department with the Los Angeles Public Library. I am excited to be here today and welcome you to today's LA Made program, History of Disneyland. And we all know that Disneyland or a trip to Disneyland is not complete without our ears. So I'm going to put them on. Here we go. But before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for, of the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for, help, for helping bring the LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events, which is also on the screen. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. We would also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.california or CA. Just as a reminder, those attending today's program will have an opportunity to win a copy of Chris's book, Walt Disney's Disneyland, which I have right here. It's a nice big coffee book right here, coffee table book, please email ecdept at lapl.org for your opportunity to win a copy. Just a reminder, oh wait, today's, today Chris Nichols presents the story of Disneyland, Walt Disney's visionary theme park in Anaheim, California. From Walt's California inspirations to the team of filmmakers, effects artists, and tinkerers who recruited, who he recruited to build the park, we will see a bountiful visual history, including stunning color photographs, concept drawings, and ephemera drawn from the historical collections of the Walt Disney Company and the golden age of photojournalism. Walt Disney's Disneyland was co-authored by Charlene Nichols, a children's librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library. She will be joining us in a few to share her process on the book, on working on the book with Chris. Welcome, Charlene. Hi, everybody. Oh, hi, I just wanted to um, quickly kind of introduce the role LAPL played in <laughs> the making of this book. Because when he brought home, when Chris brought home the um, concept from the publisher, then uh, I started thinking, of course, I would support him. So I started pulling books and um, going into the databases like the historic LA Times database and stuff. And since I'm a librarian, I got really organized and I started creating this huge Excel where each tab of the Excel was a different chapter. And I started pulling out books, um, pull quotes from the books or from the articles I was reading and putting them into this huge Excel so that they'd be organized by what chapter they should be in because I kind of understood the layout of the book as to what's going to be. So I said, okay, baby, um, I brought you home these books and he wasn't reading them. So I'm reading them and pulling out these quotes. And then I'm like, okay, I'm creating this Excel so you can start, you know, writing the book. And then he um, said like, what? what excel he did not want to look at the excel i was trying to make it so easy because every quote was like tied to the book a uh, uh, master list of the references you know that i used for those quotes in the front on the front front tab and then and then you just go to Fantasyland, say, and you would have all the quotes that had to do with Fantasyland from all these different sources. But he's like, I don't want to look at the Excel. So I ended up um, making a first draft of the book, the entire book, based on all those books and resources from the Los Angeles Public Library. Of course, he was really amazing because he... Um, I only did that kind of research. He went out to all the different archives and he went out to all the interviews of the Imagineers that are still alive and stuff. And he has uh, photo archives and he has an amazing stories to tell about everything that went into the creating of this book, which was a, a really fun project that we were both working through. So we were up at two or three in the morning sometimes answering the questions from the publisher and from D Disney Legal. So I'm definitely glad I had a partner in that because I would yell at him and then he would end up talking to the publisher in very calm words. <laughs> 
thing. So it was a real project of love between the both of us, but I don't think it would have been possible without all the resources at LAPO. And that is all I really wanted to say as part of my introduction. Thank you so much for sharing your words, Charlene. I am now pleased to introduce you to Chris Nichols. Chris is a writer and historian specializing in Southern California and architecture and culture. He currently writes Los Angeles' magazine's Ask Chris column. Welcome, Chris. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and thank you for coming to hear about Walt Disney's Disneyland and um, all of the, uh, the sort of process we went through to put it together. Uh, so thank you, Charlene, for that. And uh, I think I'll take off my mouse here. It's a little early today. Yes. And, um, you know, so for many years, I've been an editor at uh, Los Angeles Magazine. We're currently celebrating our 60th anniversary with our new issue. Um, back in the uh, old days, it, it looked like this. Um, much thinner. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, it's been a real... Um, been a real great um, 20 years at the magazine. I write the Ask Chris column where I answer questions from readers about interesting things around the city. What's that thing I saw? How do I get to this place? How do I get a tree from my yard? Are they bringing back Helm's Bakery Donuts? You know, all kinds of um, funny things that come in and I go out and figure them out. And so I've been doing that for a long time and I had done some work with the um, editors of Toshin before and uh, when they got this um, uh, deal to do these Disney books, which was a, it's a series, um, including this giant book on Mickey that they also put out in the uh, you know signature sort of Toshin way too big comes of its own handle comes of its own table kind of thing. Um, we did a really big and uh, I think beautiful uh, coffee table book um, about the history of the park and. You know, it's so hard to take something that has been written about and dissected and, and um, you know, loved by so many millions of people and to try to come up with something new. And so um, first thing to do, I think, was um, collect everything out there. That's my natural instinct anyway as a book collector and an ephemera collector. And um, so I pulled together all the existing books that, that, I, that I could find um, over the last 50 years. And then I started finding the people and um, that, that I could that were still there, that were still around. And um, so it was it was really great fun to try to pull all this together. I'm going to go to um, just show you the book and take a quick walk through the park, a quick walk through the book and see what um, we can uh, tell you about these places that we uh, all are so familiar with, but hopefully in a in a slightly new and different way um, and sort of see it through the eyes of someone who thinks about Los Angeles for a living and is um, always interested in the history of this place and what came from here. This is the uh, uh, one of the very first maps produced for the park. Um, this is what you'd get when you, when, you, um, when you walked in. This is sort of a, a continuation of a tour that I did for the LA Conservancy on the 40th anniversary of the park. And I used that little graphic right there um, on, uh, on the cover of my little homemade uh, tour booklet that we did 20 something years ago. And um, I was so happy to be able to use it legally on the front cover, you know, really uh, prominently. It's such a jaunty little happy family. Just the kid is so excited. He's just off the ground and I just love it. Um, but here's Uncle Walt. Here's the guy that made it all come true. He came to Los Angeles in 1923, came to Los Feliz where he lived um, with his uncle on Kingswell Street. Um, and the house is under uh, restoration right now and is um, coming back. Uh, the barn behind the house is where Walt set up his little movie studio. You know, um, 20, 22 year old Walt, was he 22 at the time? Um, 23, uh, came and, um, and started making cartoons in, in, in the uncle's garage. That barn, incidentally, is at the Garden Grove Museum where you can visit it today. And like I said, the house is being restored. But Los Feliz and Glendale and Burbank and Northeast LA we're all in Walt's orbit, you know, in these early years. And it was that neighborhood and, and, and Los Angeles of the 1920s that we sort of wanted to talk about in the beginning of this and kind of like try to figure out how it um, came to be and how it was different here 
<clears throat> than it would have been in um, any other place. You know, it wouldn't have been so outdoors. It wouldn't have been, you know, so movie inspired. Um, you know, it would, it would have been very different. This is a found slide from a, um, a website called Dave Land. And um, uh, found slides, you know, are kind of a newer phenomena. When people found old 35 millimeter slides years ago and they didn't have a projector, they would toss them. But now people are realizing this great historical treasure that they have. And um, people like Charles Phoenix popularized um, giving these old slides new life. And they're just wonderful, Kodachrome, brilliant, beautiful views into a lost world. And I'm so glad they kept them. Um, you know, here I say sometimes 59 feels like it has always been here, as if it just grew out of the earth, fully formed. But then I talk about, you know, all the folks that, that came together to make this happen and all of the oddities of LA that kind of um, worked their way into it, you know, and into um, pulling together uh, this, this group of folks that did this. Here's Wall, um, young Wall in the uh, Red Cross. Here he is in Europe on the right. This is the trip where he bought all the storybooks that later became the movies. He bought these um, editions of, of Snow White and of, um, you know, Pinocchio and, and all these classic books that um, he turned into movies over the years. Um, <clears throat> when Snow White was such a big hit, it was it enabled them to build the studio in Burbank, and it really enabled the company to move from a uh, an old organ showroom in Silver Lake to, on Hyperion to the big Burbank studio that they're still at. And Snow White was such a pivotal moment for the company, the first full-length feature, you know, in color, and it was such a big deal. They had the premiere at the Carthay Circle Theater, and on the left you see Shirley Temple, the biggest kid star of the 20th century, with some actors portraying some of the seven dwarves. And the um, premiere at the Carthay Circle had like an incredibly long median strip running up to it. Um, and on that strip, they built a little attraction. So if you're walking up to the, to the theater, you know, the show starts on the sidewalk. As you're walking up to the theater, you would get a whole like pre-show. They built dwarf land and there were little cottages. There was a water wheel and all kinds of, you know, and, and then the seven dwarves and characters running around and, and meeting and greeting. And that is one of the earliest, you know, earliest sort of visions of what might become Disneyland. This is the, the Tivoli Garden. This section goes into like the trip that Walt took, the trips and, and the excursions, the people that he met, the children's fairyland in Oakland, that whale on the top there, and the Chicago Railroad Fair in 1948 to um, Henry Ford... Uh, uh, in, uh, in Dearborn, the Henry Ford Museum, and, and you know, and like the combination of these sort of historical reenactment places and these sort of fantasy places and, and having young kids at the time and taking them to the carousel at Griffith Park and taking them to Beverly Park, where the uh, Beverly Center now is, um, you know, Daddy's Day, he called it, you know, when he would take them out. And it was um, not enough. He wanted more and he wanted something um, bigger and better. Uh, here's some of the fantasy environment of Los Angeles, the Tama Shanter, one of Walt's favorite restaurants, celebrating its 100th birthday this year. Uh, Clifton's Cafeteria downtown, this is the Pacific Seas branch, uh, not the one on Broadway, but um, built right around the same time. And, um, you know, I'm making notes about something. I've always dreamed of a great, great playground, he says here. And uh, the Beverly Park on the left was, you know, like little um, off-the-shelf rides. Um, and, and, and great and everything, but it wasn't the, you know, this tremendous, uh, vision that Walt had, uh, at the same time, he was tinkering with little miniature railroads and built this, uh, railroad, um, in his backyard when he moved to Holmby Hills in 1950. So, um, there's pictures of all sorts of celebrities and interesting folks and visitors coming over to the house. He'd take him to his soda fountain and he'd take him for a ride on the, um, on the backyard railroad. Then here back at the studio in Burbank, um, he started, you know, experimenting with things and building things and set up a whole shop just dedicated to building Disneyland. Here's the opening day broadcast with KBC seven setting up in front of the castle. And it's so shocking to us, uh, to me in reading and reading about Walt's accounts of this period that nobody believed in this crazy idea. 
you know, the idea first being to do something for kids that wanted to come see the studio. They would write letters and say, I want to come see Disneyland. What do I, I want to come meet Mickey. Where can I go? And so on the bottom left, you'll see this little stretch of land between what's now the 134 and the Disney Studios in Burbank. Part of it is the animation building that you see off the freeway. And much of it is still empty. But this land between Griffith Park and the Disney Studio is where Walt thought, I'll build a little attraction here, certainly grander than, you know, most other parks uh, anywhere, um, but nowhere near the vision of, of Disneyland itself. But I'll build this little this little park, and it'll have water, it'll have, you know, a desert, it'll have water, it'll have different lands. And, you know, at that point, the idea started coming together. And the city of Burbank, uh, he went and made a presentation in the city of Burbank that said, we don't want, you know, people falling off of merry-go-rounds and Ferris wheels. and We don't want the element, you know, I think meaning that they didn't want something like a, a rowdy circus carnival theme park, they didn't, or amusement park, I should say, because they hadn't seen a Disneyland, didn't know what it was. And at this point, you know, he cannot sell this concept to anybody. He cannot raise the money. He cannot get the city to go along with it. I love this picture we uncovered. Um, in the Look Magazine archives in Washington, D.C., on the upper left of Walt with his brother Roy, like saying, look, it's going to be huge. Look at me. Look at me. And Roy just staring, staring at him, not not comprehending it. You know, Roy thinking, um, you know, I'm sure he did comprehend it at this point, but, but Roy saying, you know, and how much is that going to cost? You know, Roy was the money man. Walt was the uh, visionary. And <laughs> there, he jumped through so many incredible hoops financially to pull this together. You know, um, from famously selling his life insurance, selling his name, selling his house in Palm Springs, and um, and then selling the uh, concept of a show called Disneyland to ABC. So every week, you know, they would be building up and building up to um, to the park coming together. But putting together a crew from the studio to move over to the um, to the uh, uh, you know the theme park division WED. Uh, which is now WDI, Walt Disney Imagineering. WED, Walter Elias Disney, was the um, was the separate division that started building the park and started putting it all together. Um, you've got um, Harry Burns on the left and um, and Fred Yorger and Claude Coates building uh, this big rock candy mountain, building you know different effects for the park that that may or may not have happened, building full scale models so you can see like you know, perspective from, uh, from down below, you just, you just sort of, um, can put yourself anywhere and, and understand it. Um, the same artist that worked on the Disney movies worked on the Disney attractions. And so you've got this 3d storytelling, you've got this immersive ability, you know, uh, in a movie, you know, you've got maybe color, you know, but do you have the, but do you have the ability to, to walk into the picture? You know, do you have the ability to see the people in front of you wearing, costumes like these sketches on the left and smelling the popcorn and smelling the different uh, candies and things on Main Street. This whole idea of immersive three-dimensional storytelling on a scale such as this um, and also doing it in, in out in the middle of nowhere in an, in an orange grove an hour away, you know, um, be, <laughs> was just something that nobody could quite uh, wrap, wrap, wrap their head around. But all those things came together and it uh it happened it got built in a very short amount of time here's walt on the left commuting between burbank and anaheim in a helicopter um and i love that you know in 1955 you could just pull up to the front uh to the ticket booths and just walk right in um which many of us that remember the park before uh california adventure was built will remember you could just pull right up in front this fellow on the upper left uh, is in an LAPL photograph. Um, I tried to reach him. He's still around. He was in he was in uh, Utah. And he was some kind of like doomsday prepper and didn't want to talk to me. But he was there. He got the first ticket. He was a college student. stayed stayed uh, overnight. Got the ticket. On the right, I love that this was a um, a trading card for a gumball set. And I contacted the company and they didn't have anything and they didn't have any originals. And then they said, but they do have you know. And they brought out this beautiful four by five print this uh so i could get a great color rich beautiful photo like this great black and white rich beautiful photo from the acclaimed uh photographer architectural photographer julia shulman which is in the getty collection 
um, you know, having one of the world's great architectural photographers photograph Disneyland in this, in this um, you know, Pereira designed hotel is pretty great. I wish Julius had gone next door and photographed the whole park. Um, but, you know, breaking it up into these lands and breaking it up into these themes and sort of trying to completely fool you into believing that you're in another place and time. You know, here age relives fond memories of the past. And, you know, utilizing um, as much uh, antique infrastructure as you can, you know, the, the real street lamps, you know, and, 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 and building with real materials like like iron and, 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 and things that uh, you didn't need to build with at that height, you know, but doing stuff in a, in a very realistic way to kind of um, fool the eye, fool the ear, fool the, fool the brain into thinking that you were in 1900, you know, Main Street. You were in this um, new place here. And, you know, um, Charlene la wrote a section of the book where she talks about the last stable time in America, you know, that World War II had ended not that long ago. And, and then you had the uh, Depression and World War I and that this 1900 period was a real stable time that a lot of middle-aged people were very nostalgic for and familiar with and, 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 you know, it'd be like, you know, so it's like, um, 55 years ago. So it's like, uh, you know, the mid sixties, you know, now, um, mid sixties land, it would be the, uh, you know, would be the main street if it were built today, you know, it's, it's, it's far, but it's within living memory of many people. Um, and you even went so far as to do this sort of, uh, cranberry colored apartment above the fire station uh and there's some room with lily in there and there's some room for the grandkids and and of course the uh lamp still burns in the window for walt today there were so many um places to search so much material so much had already been run um how do you come up with something new for um something that everybody is very familiar with and and um for me, I, I've been a picture researcher for a very long time, and so I just hit up every place I could. I, I, I um, spoke to, visited, um, made arrangements with about 70 different collections, archives, libraries, museums, institutions. Um, I asked friends to go take a look at some stuff. I, I went myself. I, we hired researchers in out-of-town cities and um, found stuff that, you know, was was great and interesting and odd and 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 beautiful and life magazine stuff and look and the saturday evening post and <clears throat> independent photographers that were shooting the park just pulled in as much as i can from as many different sources as i could we talk about adventure land we talk about all the different places you know in disneyland uh relating in some way to places in los angeles we talk about you know don the beachcomber you know, and the um, sort of the tiki world. We talk about the, um, um, you know, we talk about the Arboretum and sort of the overgrown jungle and the places they had filmed, um, you know, um, Tarzan. And all of these, you know, great places in Los Angeles and Southern California relating back to to Disneyland and, and the technology that came with the park, the technology that was used to build things and to build, you know, everything from, from fire glass and, um, and different new materials to technologies like audio technologies that um, were used to start and stop the uh, motion. Um, uh, and things like audio animatronics, of course, which came out of, out of, uh, out of Disneyland. Um, this, the robots and such, this photo on the lower right here um, is uh, near the Swiss Family Treehouse. There's the interior of the uh, Enchanted Tiki Room and there's a, um, you know, <laughs> there's the, uh, the funny story here. When, when Walt first saw John Hench's 1962 Bergfeld Tiki Room designs, it was originally envisioned as a restaurant, he argued against having them. They will poop on the food. Hench reassured Walt that they would not be live birds. And then they had to invent, you know, audio animatronics to fill the space. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the technology was, was really important. Um, but also the, uh, the, the art and look at these flowers and their personalities. And, and a lot of this uh, on the right here, this comes from a great artist named Rolly Crump. Uh, these insane bird designs that he uh, came up with and, the, and that, um, you know, his work around the park, I think was, was some of my favorite. 
And I was very lucky to, um, to get to meet him and to get to know him doing this project, as I was a lot of other um, folks that have been involved in, uh, in creating these things. Gosh, this picture is pretty. So many colors and so much, you know, so much going on. Um, it's Wally Bogue in Frontierland. Uh, and, you know, he was the one that did the uh, show in the uh, Golden Horseshoe Theater for so many years. And, you know, um, what, 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 a, what another world, what another weird world that he created. This sort of, um, you know, uh, American frontier. Um, people today might, might uh, you know, might, might call it uh, colonialism, uh, you know. But, but this idea of, um, of paying homage to these folks that um, came through and, 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 uh, and settled this land, if you would say. Um, but also making it um, a fun place to be and so much transportation and so much uh, so many odd ways of getting around um, so much to do so much to see Louis Armstrong on the Mark Twain um, Walt and Lillian had their anniversary party on the Mark Twain the night before the park opened when um, everything was still being put together when it was still um, you know not quite put together when when uh, when the park was just about ready to open and 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 in, a, in too short an amount of time, um, you know, that all these things uh, were, were amazingly, were built amazingly fast and were built amazingly well. And, and you know, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, frontier land still exists that, that um, to this day, the, um, the storefronts and some of the, some of the amazing ways that they've been able to incorporate the past, you know, their own past into their future. They have a, um, they have a dinosaur skeleton in the, um, you know, a fossil in the uh, Big Thunder Mountain to this day. Uh, the bubbling pots um, and that great cartoony cactus, which I think is a Mark Davis design. Um, I just, I just love all this stuff. The detail of those like crates in that uh, Tom Sawyer Island being from, um, you know, around the Mississippi River. They all, they're all um, stencil with, with um, companies and town, places in those towns in Missouri and, and such where Tom Sawyer uh, takes place. The, uh, the uh, what, do we, what do we call this? Frontierland, the Frontierland Gates, the, uh, the totems here, the teepees, um, hiring Native American actors to come and perform or um, to do these, do these dances and to uh, have stuntmen jumping off buildings and and zorro being the, one of the big hits of the time uh there i think that's guy um oh what is his name guy wilson is that his name? the actor that played zorro um anyway uh you know bringing these properties that people love so much you know books to movies that to um to uh, to life and uh and having it like having this action unfold right in front of you Here's the giant, giant uh, soda fountain root beer situation going on at uh, the Golden Horseshoe. And look, there he is, Zorro, live and in person in front of you, like in real life. You know, you're going to Zorro's universe, you know, and that's something that must have blown these kids' minds to see him on TV. And then you drive down to and I'm speaking of blown minds. Look at these kids. I just love this picture so much. The first kids and, you know. Coming out of the coming out of the castle, going into the park, and just the um, the excitement and the energy, you know, um, it 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 just shows you what what um, what it must have been like to be there in 1955. Um, I have a great picture of my mom and my family there around 1957 um, in Tomorrowland that uh, that just inspires me to no end. Uh, here's the Matterhorn under construction. Here's the uh, Skyway through the Matterhorn, which is pretty amazing. Um, Matterhorn, uh, Matterhorn bobsled, still a, a, a functioning attraction at the park from 1959. Um, and then here's here's the stuff being built on the left. These carousel horses being built and expanded and changed at the park. You know, they're antique courses where he changes the legs sometimes so that every horse is a jumper and not just a standard. You know, um, Walt talks about plussing, plussing, plussing everything. You know, you've got an antique horse. You've got a restored antique horse. Why not make it a jumper antique restored jumping horse? You know, which is pretty great. 
On the right, we've got a really uh, wonderful little piece of ephemera, a paper bag from from uh, one of the shops on Main Street with Tinkerbell on it with that logo. So you see that logo right there with the sort of, you know, uh, atomic excitement going on. And that's the logo that you would have seen on television. You would have seen that animated on the Disneyland show. And then here you are in the place they're talking about. Here's grown up Shirley Temple um, opening up the, uh, the castle and the castle walkthrough, which is a uh, 1950s attraction that was restored in uh, the last few years back to its original 1950s appearance, inspired by the art of the great Ivan Earl, who did this wonderful painting from Sleeping Beauty um, around 1958 or so. Um, more of the excitement here going on in, uh, in that strange space between Tomorrowland and Fantasyland. Um, the Matterhorn dancers, the consulate of the, you know, the, uh, the consul from Sweet, uh, Switzerland riding in the bucket with Walt. That's an LAPL photo. With, by the way, with grease pencil and paint on it from when it appeared in the uh, Herald Examiner newspaper. Um, here's a great still from the movie 40 Pounds of Trouble with Tony Curtis and and um, his girlfriend in the movie uh, dressed like Khrushchev and a little kid that they're that they're helping out dressed like uh, Fidel Castro, which I thought was pretty great. They're trying to avoid some bad guys. Actually, there's a bad guy in the background on the, on the plank there carrying his tray. They're trying to avoid bad guys, and they have a chase through Disneyland. One of the few movies ever filmed in the park. Uh, upper left, a nice LAPL photo with some homemade uh, giant uh, Mickey ears on the horses. Uh, and some nuns flying on Dumbo. And, and then here's some of the stuff that we were able to pull from the Disney archives. And that was incredible to have the, uh, the full, you know, full... Um, cooperation of Disney of pulling everything out just digging and digging digging and, and just you know I just kept saying is there anything that's um you know anything else not anything else not can you can you maybe is there anything that hasn't been seen or and so they were so great about pulling um original material uh in another case like I believe I believe these both may have come from the photographer from um look magazine who um who passed away many years ago, but I found his son and the two have his mom in New York and his son was able to have his mom in LA dig through the family collections, you know, under the bed, uh, the archive that hadn't been open in many decades and pull out some amazing photos um, that had not been seen in, you know, 50, 60 years, like this one on the top right, I mean the top left rather. This odd photo, which I just love, um, was in that collection of the, uh, of the, the uh, Look Magazine photographer. Um, <laughs> this is a great one. This is Casey Jr. Circus Train with some uh, overstimulated children uh, enjoying their afternoon at the park. Uh, there's a story about more, you know, four times more adults than children being in the park. Uh, here's some old timers on the right getting on Peter Pan. Um, yeah, here it is. Surprising about Disney's Paradise for Kids is that some days it's hard to find any bona fide children. Adults outnumbered children four to one. Oh, four to one. Um, on the left, the great Mr. Toad Carr. And um, this is a long gone since the 80, early 80s um, Skull Rock and the Chicken of the Sea restaurant where you can get tuna fish sandwiches. This is sort of where Dumbo is now and that the, uh, in that the uh, entirety of Fantasyland got pushed a little bit north to um, to enlarge it in 1983. Look at this weird behind the scenes blacklight photo of Peter Pan. I uh, gotta love that. And Tomorrowland. This was so exciting to research to find these things because I'm such a uh, great fan of googie architecture and the sort of futurist aesthetic um, that went into uh, that went into Tomorrowland in 1955. Um, here's a great shot that's been seen a bit, but I just love it of the, of the employee cafeteria with Snow White and the, uh, cowboy and the spaceman and Goofy. Um, and here's a wonderful illustration of the clock of tomorrow where I said my, my, my mom and my grandparents were, um, it's a clock, but it's a spectacular piece of modern art. It's gorgeous design with that rocket ship in the background, you know, Walt, use that term weenie to describe something way in the distance that would get you to keep moving through. 
and pull you in and pull you to the back of the of the area. And I mean, you know, the idea of this is that this is like, you know, is this going to happen in five years? You know, is this going to happen in ten years? Are we going to go, you know, on a on a on a uh, on a ride to the moon? Are we going to go to, um, you know, do these uh, do these wild things in in, in space? Uh, this is a uh, the Circarama exhibit, which some of you may remember was a 360 degree um, uh, film. Uh, the, oh, the chemistry, the best. Um, and this is uh, Debbie Reynolds and um, her boyfriend, Elizabeth Taylor, stole away. Uh, what's his name? Eddie Fisher. Um, and, you know, Tomorrowland just, oh, gosh. Um, there's a crump design on the top of the flying saucer ride. Uh, short-lived flying saucer ride. Uh, but I got to tell you, it was probably Bob Gurr that I spent the most time with. Um, this designer, seen here on the left, bottom left, he's 90, he's 90 now, and he is like mountain bike riding, uh, go-go dancing, like 90-year-old dude, who is like the most incredible resource for historic Disneyland. He was there before day one. He was there designing these cars. He had come from Art Center in Pasadena and um, and met Walt. And um, Walt said, can you design a car? And he designed the, the car for Autopia. And then he said, well, okay, now, now build it. And and Bob didn't, was an engineer, but he taught himself how to do this and found the right people and built these cars. Here's uh, here's one of Bob's first cars with a fellow named uh, Frank Sinatra uh, and Frank Jr. riding in, um, in the opening day of Autopia there in 1955. Um, but just the, the house of the future, which apparently has been recreated at the Howard Johnson's in Anaheim. I keep hearing about this, and I need to get down there and see it. But across the street from Disneyland, Howard Johnson's has built a, uh, not an exterior, but an interior decor a room uh, designed after the house of the future, Monsanto house of the future at Disneyland. Um, on the left, uh, Vice President Richard Nixon uh, cut the ribbon for the monorail in 1959. Art Linkletter looks like he's driving there in the top, but really it's Bob Gurr who is driving the monorail that day. Um, this John Hench illustration of the two monorails crossing, just, gosh, it's pretty. And it reminds me of the um, the idea uh, of how everything, you know, Disneyland occupies the same space, how they're just masters of stacking things. They have a lot of land, but, you know, they stack... Um, uh, a skyway uh, on a, on a, on top of a monorail on top of a, you know, a submarine, just so many different crazy kinetic action movements um, and so much happening in the park that um, my God, by 1959, they're, um, they're rebuilding sections by, by 1963, they're well, probably even earlier than that. They're building stuff for the New York world's fair. And here's Walt talking about this idea of the Florida Project, what would become Epcot. Um, and this is, you know, he's like really like firing on all cylinders. And there's so much happening. And they've got all this new technology that's paid for by other people that they're going to get back at the end. So General Electric wants this carousel of progress. And it's going to be full of robots. And it's going to be four theaters. And it's going to revolve. And when it's done, it comes back to Disneyland. The state of Illinois pays for an exhibit about Abraham Lincoln. But they want Abraham Lincoln to stand and talk and, like, be real. And so, like, Agur and, the, and these guys design this and uh, design this incredibly lifelike robot that freaks people out, you know, that it's um, people think he's real. Um, we've got uh, Martin Luther King and his kids riding in the Ford Magic Skyway through Primeval World there on the bottom right. Um and and you know and the, of course the colors and the design and the uh, the um, the zazz that comes out of Mary Blair on the right you know in the movies like all the colors if you've seen Saludos Amigos or the Three Caballeros of those those movies the stuff that she did in the and that's amazing on the left you've got um, uh, Robert Richard Sherman uh, composers you see they have the small world figure on top of their piano so sometimes people ask me what my favorite attraction is and oh my god these mary blair paintings i, I, I can't i just can't They're too great and crump Rolly crump um people ask me if i have a favorite attraction and i mean gosh thinking about all these people these 
my heroes, these artists that I just love and admire um, coming together to do Small World, you know, uh, that's Trump on the left in the yellow shirt with that um, model of the, basically that's the sign for It's a Small World. Um, Walt let employees do exhibits in the library and Crump uh, made one with uh, mobiles, with little spinning things and he balanced them on a pin and Walt liked it so much he moved him from, I believe he was working on 101 Dalmatians over to Imagineering and he designed that crazy thing which unfortunately didn't survive the World's Fair and got destroyed at the end of the run of the fair but and they built the new facade at Small World which we all know and love and could never live without that um you know, you've got Mark Davis's wife, Alice Davis, up here on the right doing costumes. Uh, the, the left is the guy from Bank of America that paid for it, um, you know, for moving it to, uh, to California. Um, and then it starts to get even more deep, more detailed with New Orleans Square and the level of, <laughs> the level of um, design and construction and thematic element, you know, thematic restaurants like the Blue Bayou and the absolute insanity of Pirates of the Caribbean where it's not just Lincoln, but it's a whole town and they're all alive and they're all trying to get you, you know, that there's so much happening. Um, um, you know, one of the Imagineers said, uh, well, said, well, you know, there's too much going on. Is it too much? And they said, oh, no, it'll be like a cocktail party where you you can't hear all the conversations, but you want to get coming back. So it's like, you know, peak, pinnacle, everything's going great. And then Walt dies. And he had this new Tomorrowland in the works. You know, he had so much going on. He was not really spending a lot of time working on studio movies. They were doing live action movies. Um, it's all Disneyland, 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 and the upcoming Florida thing. Um, Disney World, you know, the adventures through inner space in the bottom right with the uh, drop of water. See that in the microscope? Um, I asked the archives if they had this old brochure that I had found. And they said, no, we don't have it, but we have all the original art that was not used for it. So I, I, you know, we ran every single one of these. This is all from adventures through inner space. This is all, you know, molecules and atoms and such. And, you know, so many great things were happening. Um, Wolf's brother Roy kept it going, you know, and got Epcot and got, got Disney World built, not the way Walt had envisioned it, but got it built. Um, there's the new tomorrow on the right with the people mover and the rocket jets. And then in 1977, they add space mountain and you know, it, 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 uh, keeps growing. Walt's not there, but they keep it, they keep it growing for a while. And they keep things, new things happening. Captain EO is coming through, um, in the 80s star tours, you know, so it, it's, um, it's all going in kind of different directions and things are different, but I mean, you know, the, the, the people that are the people are still, you know, the imaginary is still churning out amazing stuff and pulling up old concepts like the haunted house from the late fifties becomes the haunted mansion. And here's some of these crazy crump drawings, um, and so they they re, they re um, rethink that, and um, you know, a great team comes together and, and is it going to be funny or is it going to be scary? And kind of comes up with something that's sort of halfway in the middle. There's the uh, Yale Gracie with the famous hatbox ghost. That went away for 50 years and came back and now everybody loves it and um its head actually disappears <laughs> this time around unlike the first time apparently but all these great concept drawings from mark davis and then and then 1983 demolishing and rebuilding fantasy land and this great quote i remember tony baxter an imagineer standing in the middle of the wreckage of walt's favorite land standing there going what have we done that was scary but it came out great and so trusting great designers like like Tony Baxter and, and the, the people of his generation to come up with even more um, detailed and elaborate and beautiful versions of Walt's classic favorites. Toontown from the 90s, now closed for a big reimagining. Country Bear Jamboree in the early 70s. There's that dinosaur I was telling you about at um, in the railroad there. We've got the, uh, this is what, this is what Carousel turned into, uh, a show called America Sings. Um, where animatronic animals tell the story of American music, which is there through the 70s and, and 80s, and uh, now big empty building. Uh, Splash Mountain, using the music of um, Song of the South, Zippity Doo Dah, and um, recycling some of the characters from this attraction <laughs> into a new into a new show. Um, and you know, the Indiana Jones is this new new and exciting technology, and um, it's built on a big massive scale like Pirates. 
you know, and it's really one of the best rides of the last 30 years, best shows, best designs, um, and really super complicated stuff. And then the parking lot becomes California Adventure, and then Cars Land, and then Star Wars is, you know, coming at the time of the book, and it hadn't been built yet. But, you know, talk about immersive. The signs aren't even in any, any human language. You know, the whole thing is um, extremely immersive to the point where they have stormtroopers terrorizing you in the streets. But, you know, as long as there is imagination left in the world, um, this night will never be completed, said Walt. So anyway, it's, um, it's still growing. It's still happening. It's still the happiest place on earth. And I love it. So thank you for taking a trip to Disneyland with me. And thank you to the Los Angeles Public Library for um, having me speak today. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I, I'll hang around for any questions if you want to do that. That was so great, Chris. I, we have a lot of comments about how beautiful the pictures were. And I just want to remind folks that there is a chance for you to get a copy. If you email, they'll put the email on the screen in a second, but it's ecdept at lapl.org. And you don't want to miss this. It's a beautiful book just to see it. Um, we do have a few questions. And remember, if you have any questions, please put it on the chat and we will hopefully get to them. Let me, I think they'll put one up on the screen in a second of questions, but great comments, very loved. Okay, so the first one is by Michael, and they ask, thoughts on the current state of the parks, or park? Well, um, you know, I, I, I think that um, it's, as a preservationist and a historic preservationist, I'm astounded that they've been able to keep so much stuff from 60 plus years of the park, that yeah. You could still go there and you could still have the same experience that your grandparents had, or your great grandparents had, you know, and their great ability to, to sandwich stuff in on top of, below, next to, around, other things <laughs> is amazing. I went backstage at, um, uh, at Behind Pirates, the, the, the uh, Club 33, and you can see it when you're walking through the kitchen, how all the different, you know, layers are built up on top of each other and just the, the amount of, um, Stuff that's still around is really great, and I love it. Star Wars yeah. Land, trippy. It's wild. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, you know, I, I I don't particularly like being harassed by the stormtroopers. But <laughs> oh, it's part of the it's part of the thing, you know. Um, I I, I like that. Like the uh, immersive part of it has become more immersive, and that yeah. people um are really into that now. And um, you know, I think that there's a lot of a lot of great things. There's stuff I don't like, of course, but you know, I I I uh, it's a lot more than I do. Yeah. Well, it's always, as you said, the happiest place on earth. And it's true. If you haven't been to Star Wars land, um, it is a bit of a surprise, the engagement with yeah. certain folks. Um, I've experienced it. Oh um, I've, I've almost cried. They've always, I've, I'll tell you a story later. No, I, don't, I, don't like, I don't want to cry at Disneyland. I don't like those stormtroopers. I know. I mean, it was funny, but it was intense. And it, I loved it. I loved it. But oh, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, second question is by Kevin. And they asked, what did Walt think of Knott's Berry Farm? I liked Walt's Berry, Knott's Berry Farm. They had their meeting there when they bought up all the land. They all went to, <laughs> they all went to, to for Disneyland. They all went to lunch at the chicken dinner restaurant. Oh, um man. You know, yeah, uh, there were a lot of things about it that he that he liked, and um, you know, including the railroad having a full size mm -hmm. railroad was a big deal. Um, so yeah, for sure, um, big fan. As a mind, amazing. Love that. Yeah, it, it's it's great. It's different, even though they're in the same like city or in close proximity. Yeah, um, I think just the experience you have at Disneyland is completely different from Knott's. And I think I always recommend both parks. So. I'm not a roller coaster guy. I'm going there yeah. for the art direction. You know, I go for the food and the, <laughs> just the people view. So I feel you. All right. Second, a third question is what was your most, what was the most amazing photo find? Like oh, today? good question, Tiffany. Um, I think that stuff that was under the bed for 50 years, <laughs> that was really <laughs> exciting. I kept getting those calls. Like I'm going to get mom to go look at, Mom's opening the box. Mom's pulling it up, you know, and then I would, you know, and then he brought it all over to me and I could pull through it and, and see the, uh, see this original stuff and like large format too. I mean, Tashin has really, really high standards. If you ever seen any of their books, they're beautiful. All of them are just beautiful. And I couldn't just use a Xerox copy of something, you know, or I couldn't yeah. use a, um, unless, you know, I did use some tourist photos, but they were beautiful, rich Kodachrome yeah. slides. They were spectacular. Um, so that was, you know, that was really exciting to find all this 
all this great stuff and then try to find the original, try to find yeah. the negative or try to find, you know, try to find the earliest version of it that was clean <laughs> and perfect and beautiful. And that's what yeah. we tried to do. That's amazing. And the book shows it. I mean, these photos, I was like flipping through pages and I'm like, wow, these are, these are great. Uh, next question is, uh, is, were minorities minorities always welcomed at Disneyland? If no, when did things change? I remember going to Disneyland in the early '80s when we arrived in California. Well, what what did you what would, I'd be interested to hear your experience in the early '80s? Um, I think that you know I wasn't there, but from everything I've heard, there was there were the, 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 everybody was welcome. Um, and I mean, in a lot of the photos that I found, there are folks that are you know from all over the world in those photos, and um, I've never. I've never heard anything, um, you know, that's, that, that's precluded that. So I'd be, I'd be real interested to hear, hear what your, what your memories of it are. Hopefully they share, cause they yeah. know they comment. So hopefully they comment back. Um, next question. All right. Do you think the term immersive was used by Walt? Probably not Danny. <laughs> I think that, um, I think it was just, I think they were inventing something new. You know, I think they were coming up with um, with a whole new way to experience a movie. You know that you could you could watch you could read or you could watch the story of Mr. Toad, or then you could live it. You know, um, I don't know that they I don't know that they would have, but it's what they meant. I think mm, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Next question. Do we have any more? Okay. Oh. We have a comment. Oh wait, no, a question and a comment. I loved riding the Skyway from Tomorrowland to Fantasyland. Why did that go away? And you can still yeah. see part of it, right? I feel like from Autopedia. Uh, I think that the um, I think that the Fantasyland station disappeared in the last couple of years, but it was still hiding in there in the bushes mm -hmm. for a yeah. real long time. I think it was around 1985, 86 that it closed. And yeah, I I have childhood memories of riding it um, and being kind of terrified. And yet, loving loving the view and loving to see everything. But um, you know, I I the the story that I keep seeing is you know my two least favorite words, insurance purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, <laughs> it was also a custom weird thing that was probably expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a lot of the stuff at Disneyland was custom, custom, custom. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's it's hard to keep up with that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Gur, Gur told me he would lay underneath the. Um, Alice in Wonderland teacups and look for for um, uh, uh, damage after yeah. after every evening of going through the he would look for um, you know welds that needed to be fixed every night at the beginning wow. you know um, the just the stuff <laughs> you know, when you're when you're building something that hasn't been built before you mm. you know there's a lot of trial and error and there's a lot of um, it's expensive yeah. to keep trying to come up with um, reinventing the wheel. Like kind of literally, they kind of reinvented the wheel with all these new um, people mover systems. Not just the people mover TM, but I mean the Omni mover and the and the Skyway buckets and the monorail and all these different things that they were uh, using to get people around the park were really new and weird. And some of, and it's amazing they lasted for you know decades. You know, and 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 it's amazing that the ones that are still going are still going, which yeah. is so cool. And, and even the new ones, right? Like I see, I think a lot of us, when we're at the park, we always get a little annoyed, right? When the, like the ride breaks down, but it, like, it's good to remind yourself, right? That this is also like innovative and it continues and the work and the safety. For sure. Yeah. Um, my, my, right. my, my friend, uh, Mark had a party there after hours one day and which was really exciting. And we got to go on a tour of the shop underneath um, Indiana Jones and wow. saw how those vehicles are like broken apart constantly taken apart yeah. and rebuilt like just for safety and for you know to keep them reliable they yeah. break they they they, they, re, they take the entire <laughs> car apart and rebuild the entire car like over and over and over again so that it's perfect and new every day okay i'm gonna ride that ride differently now <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, i well yeah and I, I think the mechanics behind it and just the team it takes to make your experience beautiful is i think overwhelming and it's a good reminder for us who go often yeah um so the next question or comment and yeah comment thank you for your answer chris what i remember is fun times at disneyland till this day at 51 years old i love disneyland so do yeah, i that's, that's yeah i'm here i'm really happy. disney adult <laughs> yeah thank you very much for that comment okay um do you think walt ever thought 
of giving up on his dream, it must have been difficult to sell his vision to. Oh my God, the tenacity to just keep <laughs> going and going. No, 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 for years. And he kept doing it. And he kept coming up with new things to sell, <laughs> new ways to like pitch it. Like, no, that's not normal. You know, it's amazing that he did that. Um, I never read any account of him giving up. I mean, and it went on for so long. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, Snow White is 30, uh, 38, you know, um, and the park opens at 55. That's a long time to be working on it. Yeah. You that's know, amazing. And to keep, just pushing, pushing, pushing to make it happen. You know, as, as they used to say, it's one man's dream, you know, and yeah. he, uh, God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> he was stubborn. He made it. All right. Uh, yeah. How did he come up with the name Disneyland? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll take your, I'll take your thoughts on that, Regina. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably uh, Disney and land. Uh, but I, I'm not, I, I, I can't answer that one. Sorry. I don't <laughs> It's like, um, you know, how did they come up with the name grilled cheese? They, they grilled oh. cheese. I mean, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I mean it, it makes sense, right? Um, okay. I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine. Okay, what was, what is your favorite part of the park? I, like I said, I, I, I love Small World just because it's like going to an art gallery. I like, you know, and a, and a, and a music production. Um, there's, a line, there's a line in the book from John Hench, the Imagineer, that said, People don't come out whistling the architecture. Um, but yeah, that was funny. But the, <laughs> it's, the, it's the music. It's the. I mean, the small world is when you when you the, no, the more you know about something, the more you appreciate it. I think. Mm -hmm. And knowing all the people that worked on that particular attraction at the height of their powers, you know, at at, at the height of everything, working directly with Walt, it's amazing. Um, I think that um, we should also mention that the book is available at Los Angeles Public Library. Mm -hmm. So thank you yeah. very much for carrying it. It's at Central and and uh, oh look at that seven nine three four one seven. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, if you don't oh, get yeah, your chance to win it. Yeah, and you can win one. Isn't that neat? Yeah, yeah. You can check it out, and if you get lucky, you can maybe win one. So, alrighty. Okay. I so next comment is I thought I couldn't learn anything new anything new about Disneyland, but there's so much more that's new to me. Hooray! Aw, thank you very much, Dana. Um, okay. I just I just want to say that my, my favorite part of the whole project was getting to know all these people that I had read about, you know, oh, wow. and just like this is like my high school yearbook of everybody That's that I cool. met while working on, you know, you know, I had them all sign the book for me. And this is like such a treasure that I got to spend time with these people and work with them. And, and I just really uh, admire them all. Yeah. And um, I'm so grateful to have done this. And I'm so grateful to have been here today. So thank you. Yeah. Very much. So, and we loved having you. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your wisdom and your experience and just the history behind it and for Charlene, you know, uh, her background and experience. So thank you so much. We hope you all enjoyed the program. Uh, and then, so thank you so much for joining today's LA Made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next LA Made program on Thursday, May 19th at 4 p.m where we welcome writers Jeff Yang, Phil Yu, and Philip Wang, authors of the New York Times and LA Times bestselling book, Rise, a pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. Rise is an intimate, eye-opening, and frequently hilarious tour through Asian America's pop culture touchstones from the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and beyond. Those attending this free virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book. So until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. The successes of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you.